All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So just really quickly, um, we'll go through the agenda for tonight. So we'll start with uh, our introductions, then we'll have uh, Tara Rollins is gonna do our community member share for the night. Uh, Alex is going to give an overview of the newest UTA long range transit plan. And then Miranda from the WFRC office is gonna give a legislative wrap up. And then we'll have some time for an open, kind of open questions for our transportation partners from UDOT, uh, MAG, uh, WFRC and UTA, and then we'll have open discussion and announcements. Um, so let's go through, I'll drop, drop the share and we'll start with introductions. So I'm Lauren Victor, the long range transportation planner with the Wasatch Front Regional Council. Curtis Herring, executive director of the Utah Transit Riders Union. Mike Christensen, uh, executive director of the Utah Rail Passengers Association and also a member of the Salt Lake City Planning Commission. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Andrew Gruber. I'm executive director of the Wasatch Front Regional Council and welcome to WFRC. Hello, Alex Baim. Whoops. I'm with UTA Planning. Hi, everyone. Seamus Guido with WFRC. I work with Lauren and the Long Range Planning Group. Hi everyone, Miranda Jones-Cox. I do government affairs here at WFRC. Jeremy Shinoda, Ogden resident, Ogden Planning Commission. I'm Toya Jules. I am a Salt Lake City resident and I am the founder of Village Street Health and I work with the University of Utah. Hey everyone, this is Megan Waters with UTA Community Engagement Department. And Olivia Vons with UTA Planning. Okay, so then let's go online and we'll start with Tara. Tara Rollins with the Utah Housing Coalition. Thanks. Then we'll go to Carolyn. Oh, you're on mute. I bought three of the same. Good afternoon, everyone. Carolyn Hoskins, uh, DDI Vantage, Early Head Start former planning commissioner for Salt Lake City and a resident. Great, thanks. And then we'll go to Halima. We will come back. We'll go to Sarah. Hello, Sarah Cody, she, her pronouns. I'm Salt Lake City president. Wonderful. And we'll go back to Halima. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Halima Noor. I am here to represent the refugee population. I issue her as pronouns. And um, yeah, thank you. Wonderful. And then we'll go to Tishel. Good evening, everyone. Tishel Wright with Project Success Coalition, representing Ogden area and Salt Lake. Great, then we'll go to Bianca. Hello, everyone. Our name is Bianca. Um, I am a Long Ridge Planner slash Community Liaison with the Greater Salt Lake Municipal Services District. Wonderful. Kendall? Yep, I'm Kendall Willardson, and I am a Transportation Planner with MAG. Great. Sandra? Sandra, resident of Salt Lake City, and I do a lot with OCA Utah. Great, thanks. I think those are all our folks online. I believe, Jade, did you come in? Jay Aguilar, Utah Department of Transportation, Long Range Planning. Okay, great. I think that's everyone. So next we'll move to our community member share and Tara has agreed to share with us tonight. So Tara, I'll hand it over to you. Um, can I share my screen? Do I have permission to do that? I believe so. Let me know if you have any issues with that. I always have issues because I can't find my um at the bottom of your screen there should be a, a green button. There you go. Yeah, but it's not sharing properly. Hold on. <clears throat> well, I'll just stop right in. So um 
just a little bit about the coalition. Um, we are a nonprofit and um, and we're a membership based organization that is all about um, increase in housing that people can afford. And um, really, you know, affordable housing is irrelevant for all of us. Because if we're paying more than 30% of our income to housing, we're not living in housing that we can afford. Um, and so um, the coalition <clears throat> over the years has um, have done a lot on the Hill. And right now um, it's, we have a lot of people under the tent of affordable housing and the correct people, let's say, um, the people that have um, a lot more power to, to get things through. Um, in terms of, I would say, um, like the League of City and Towns, you know, they represent all the cities and towns. And so, um, you know, they have definitely an investment um, in that. Also, um, we also have, you know, banks and um, for-profit, non-profit developers in there. Um, also, Wasa Trent Regional Council and MAG, I mean, Everybody's um, up there, you know, having a conversation, um, especially when the commission is meeting, um, and that is the Commission on Housing Affordability. And so what, that was one of the bills that the Utah Housing Coalition did pass um, many years ago um, with um, Becky Edwards is was to put the um, commission together so we could get people in the room to talk about the problem of housing. And so I'm going to try to share once again. I just don't see my PowerPoint. Do I don't know why I do. Do you want to send it? Do you want to email it to me and then maybe I could share it? Um, sure, let me it's try. Lauren, by the way. I do this all the time, so I don't understand why it's having problems. Yeah, we've all been there. That's weird. I, I just can't find my file. Here it is. Yay. Jeez, Jeez Louise. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's late, huh? <laughs> okay, let's start from the beginning. Um... See, all this stuff is in the way up there. And you're just going to have to listen. I'll look at it this way. Sorry. Um, okay. What is affordable housing and why should we care? And so we we indicated that, you know, if you pay more than a third of your income, you're not living in affordable housing. And so I'm going to just give you a few um, numbers um, to, to look at. So some of the state facts are in order to afford a two bedroom um, house, I mean, housing, um, could be a house or apartment, you need to be um, making $24.93. And so that's a state figure um, in our counties, um, it ebbs and flows. Um, and I would say MAG and um, Salt Lake County is extremely high. Um, and so the number of renters that we have in the state, um, and then also the number of renters that um, we have at 30% of AMI and 30% of AMI is area median income. And that is um, extremely low um, income. And so when the, past, the legislature passed um, funding, it was for deeply affordable housing. And so that is really at 30% of area median income. Um, and as you will see um, further along, you'll you'll understand what the money is. So, um, <clears throat> and then also at fifty percent, we have extremely a lot of people that are making fifty percent of AMI um, as well. And so, when you're talking about the area median income, you're looking at a salary of you know thirty one thousand. And then monthly, and as, as you can see, hourly, I always like to look at it hourly because it really puts more of, you know, a face on, 
you know, what people are doing for jobs. Um, 50%, as you can see, it is, it's higher. Um, and we go to 60%. Um, and that's $30 an hour. And then 80% of um, area median income is 33. And so where do we want to be investing our money as a state? And I think, um, you know, in the past couple of years, we've been really focused on putting money into 80% of AMI um, so people could purchase homes and in higher actually than that. And so who are our 30% of AMI? Well, 43% of them are in the workforce. And I would say probably 43% are the people that we depend on every day um, in our daily lives, whether we go in and get a coffee or we um, go to the grocery store, we go um, and drop off our child at um, daycare, we go drop off the other child as a teacher. You know, these are all lower wage jobs. Um, we also have disabled um, and their income most likely will not change um, over the years. And then we have a lot of seniors. Um, and so when you look at the inventory gap, as I said, um, we'll start at the very bottom, extremely low. For every 100 we need, we only have 31 units available. So, you know, we're down 69 units per 100 that we need. And we go up, you know, and 50% of AMI, um, we're, you know, 43. As you can see, as we go higher, we're more in, you know, a range that it works for um, that income level. And so the question is, you know, is this where we want to be putting our um, our state dollars? We really need to be, you know, investing in 50% and below because that is our workforce. Um, just to show how people are struggling, um, you know, cost burden, um, is, you know, paying over 30% of your um, income to housing and then um, severely is, is paying more than 50%. And as you can see, as you go up in income, people are less um, struggling um, to pay their rent. Um, and so this is just the housing profile. Um, this is a tool that we use when we go to um, Federal, as you can see, um, we have our senators on there. And then also the out of reach report that comes out every year. It will be coming out next month. Um, and I wanted to give you an idea of the wages. So when you're looking at you know, the top ones, um, we have a lot of cashiers. We have a lot of retail, teaching assistants. I highlighted the home health, personal care aides and nursing assistants to show you how low of income um, they do make. And these are people we depend on um, every day um, to be taking care of you know, our elderly and, as well as um, people coming into homes um, to care. But um, also, you know, we have over 300,000 jobs that are making less than 16, 60 an hour. Um, and so in order to be able to afford a one bedroom, it's 1671. So I wanted to give you an illustration of how many jobs we actually have um, that are under the a one bedroom. I wanted to talk a little bit about evictions because evictions um, is a very costly thing for an individual. I always say that it, excuse me, <clears throat> um, financially cripples people. And so um, I only have up to 2022. Um, they've gone up since the pandemic, um, but I would say it rebounded to probably 217, 2017, and it is, um, it's climbing. Um, we had a big issue before um, COVID with people being able to um, afford their homes. And so rental assistance really prolonged that um, issue out um, in terms of, you know, people, um, being able to afford their housing. And so one of the things that yeah, I like to talk about is, you know, people don't understand, you know, really eviction and how much it costs. And so this is an extremely low one, but, you know, somebody comes in and they fill out an application fee, and then the moving costs, um, you know, lease initiation, deposit, the rent, uh, media and carport. Those are really minor in terms of fees. Um, 
And so then you have your um, your total um, that you owe each month. And then, and that's not considered rent. Uh, rent is 1139 But with all the fees, it goes up. And then when you look at um, if you can't pay your rent, um, then you get a three-day pay or vacate. And if you don't vacate, every day you stay after you get charged three times the daily rent. And so somebody who is in there from 12, I mean, um, February 8th to the 18th, they owe additional 1253 and then future rent because they couldn't afford, or they couldn't rent it out. They're liable for future rent. Um, and as you can see, that's a, a lot of money. And then, um, then it goes into debt collection, which they can add 40% onto um, and 24% um, interest. So as you can see, I mean, this is a low one. I mean, I've seen them up to, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars um, $30,000. And so how many renters are affected? Um, people always say, okay, it's one eviction, but really our household size are large. And so when you look at the amount of people that it does affect, um, it's a lot. And, and so, you know, people don't think about the other um, people that are living in the home. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, why is it important to look at size is that, you know, back in 22, we had um, almost 16,000 students that um, was identified by the school system for the McKenney Vento. And it's much different, um, I would say definition than a regular homeless. Um, they use a different one for a school system. And that is, you know, if you doubled up um, or in your car um, living, you know, they count you. And so on a given day um, each year, they do a count um, in all the schools. Um, and so what does this mean from, you know, money, money that is not going out into, um, you know, our community in terms of economy is, you know, the average eviction is 4,000. So when you look at the, the amount of evictions and the total judgments, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of funding. So, um, you know, opportunity starts at home and this is why we should really care about, you know, housing because education is housing. You know, we have students um, turning over in our, our school systems rapidly. Um, and, you know, how can a teacher teach or a child learn? Um, you know, health is um, housing. We, you know, have heard a lot about, you know, <clears throat> the social determinants of health um, when it comes to housing. Um, it's, it's, it's vital. Um, hunger is housing. You know, if, you, if you're staying in a hotel, um, you know, you don't have a proper place to prepare food um, and you're most likely eaten out of a 7-Eleven or a convenience store. Um, racial equity is housing. Um, you know, we see that when it comes to mixed income neighborhoods and, um, and I mean, mixed income neighborhoods benefit everyone. And so, you know, we really need to you know, have people living, you know, in higher opportunity areas so they can also, you know, have the American dream. Um, economic mobility is housing, criminal justice is housing, disability rights is housing, and homeless is housing. You know, housing influences outcomes across many sectors, and there's confirmed research, if anybody wants to look at that, um, it's opportunity um, starts at home and the National Low Income Housing Coalition started this campaign, I wanna say about eight years ago maybe. Um, and it was a way to get the different sectors talking to one another about housing and how, um, you know, if we were to invest in housing, how um, other areas would be able to um, save um, money um, in their investment of let's say criminal justice or, um, hunger or healthcare, um, et cetera. So um, that's it. I just wanted to give you an idea of housing. Um, and a lot of people, they know it's important, um, but they have never really, you know, seen numbers around it. Um, and so, 
just to give you an idea um, of a few other things that the coalition does, we um, um, we gravitate to fires. Normally, if somebody's not taking care of it and somebody calls us, we tend to try to resolve the issue in some way um, with our partners. And if not, then we would take it over um, as a lead um, with our members. For example, foreclosure was huge. And so we were able to get a $1.8 million grant from the governor um, to help support um, nine agencies across the state to do housing counseling. Um, we've also did a lot with um, with manufactured homes. Um, we ebb and flow in that space, uh, depending on if there's a tenant um, group that's working. Um, so right now um, there is not. And so we're working with Rock USA and Weber County to um, put a grant in um, to help purchase a park. Um, so that's kind of, and we might not do anything with manufactured homes again for another two or three years. Um, so so we just ebb and flow around. We, have, we do a lot of education as well in terms of our conference um, and as um, members want um, us to find people to do the education piece or, um, you know, just within our membership, we can um, do that type of stuff. <clears throat> so that's it. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> do you have a, this is Jay Aguilar from UDOT. Do you have a sense of whether the, like the statistics you shared are well accepted or are there um, challenges? I mean, not challenges, but differences of opinion as far as where we really stand. And are we doing, well, maybe could you characterize whether we're doing a better job as a state and as cities to um, understand and address some of these problems? Yes. Um, I would say <clears throat> that years ago, um, maybe even, you know, up to four years ago or five years ago, those numbers, they've always been available, but they've never been really used um, in the way that they're being used today. And I think um, that Kim Gardner um, Institute has really, you know, done us justice in our state in terms of putting those out um, when people, the right people are, you know, accessing Kim Gardner to put out reports, important people. <laughs> and so um, a lot of those figures are, figures that we just used, I just used. Um, um, Jim Wood, for the longest time, has, you know, worked with the National Low Income Housing Coalition um, because they put the Outer Reach report out and the GAP report. I think um, that this pa a past report just recently has shown bigger numbers than the National Low Income Housing Coalition has shown in terms of what is needed for under 50% of AMI. And um, those numbers are being looked at by legislators. And um, I would say that our, um, our homeless um, czar, <laughs> however you want to call him, um, Wayne Niederhauser has done a, a great job in facilitating those numbers as well as um, talking about the challenges of building housing to that level because you don't have the income um, of rent to you know pay in the future um, for the expenses that are needed to put on a new roof or maintenance, et cetera. So um, I think he's done a, a fabulous job. Um, but I think there's still work to be done. I mean, we can accept the numbers and look at the numbers, but um, but action um, shows all. And I, I think that the legislature has shown action in the way that they have put money into deeply affordable housing and, you know, really working on, you know, homelessness. But at the same time, 30% um, of AMI, as you looked at, um, you saw is our workforce. And so that's really where we need to be investing, especially if we're going to, you know, maintain our, you know, um, tourism and wanting to make sure we have an, the infrastructure for people to come and enjoy our state um, because the people who are making that possible sometimes are commuting far um, away. <laughs> 
So did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Come on, Andrew, you must have a question. <laughs> Andrew. Lauren, were you gonna say something? No, I was just gonna ask if there are any other questions. I, I have a few things. Uh, first, we've had a, a few people join us since we started. So if you didn't introduce yourself already, will you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone, Stephen Richardson, um, Ogden City, now Layden City, actually. Uh, but uh, Weaver State Director, uh, strate Strategic Initiatives. Thanks. Uh, Brighton Pease, Salt Lake City resident. Okay, thanks for being here. Um, <clears throat> Tara, thank you so much for all the information you provided. And Tara does a great job and has for a long time in um, advocating for for low income, lower income Utahns and, and housing. And um, two things, one, well, I wanna ask everybody a question, but before I get to that, I wanna know this Wasatch Choice Community Advisory Committee, Council Commission Committee is, um, I knew it was something, um, is, is mainly focused on transportation, right? We know that. But we also know that when it comes to real people's lives, the biggest cost, and Tara, you noted this, the single largest cost in most uh, households' um, expenditures is housing. And the second biggest is transportation. And so the two of those items, we actually, we, we think of this as H plus T, the housing plus transportation cost. And when you think about cost burden, you have to think about both of those things. Um, and so this is why one of the reasons that trying to make sure that people have access to available and affordable transportation relates to what Tara is talking about, about housing costs, because the overall cost burden for, for people, for families. And so we know that. So I just wanted to tie that link together. When we talk about housing, it relates to transportation also. Um, and then my second question, and I think I know the answer to this already, but I'm just curious, like by show of hands or comment in the room or online, even if your camera's not on, your microphone's not on, uh, we're still looking and talking to you. So um, are you experiencing this in your own communities? Are you seeing that uh, the people in your communities, the people that you represent and work with are struggling with housing affordability, either to, to own a home or to rent a home? Or are you finding that people are cost burdened? So I'm seeing nodding heads. I mean, I know this is a big issue, but does anybody want to just comment briefly on what you're seeing in your own communities? I'm seeing yes. Sarah raised her hand. I don't know if that was just a like an agreement or if you had a comment. No, it's just happening. Okay. Yeah. Wanted to make sure. I think um, one of the things, you know, Andrew, I, I don't know why I didn't put some slides in about this, but um, if you have housing, um, if you have transportation, you can spend more in housing. Um, and so it's equitable housing. And that's the important piece of blending these two together is one is in some ways, Rob P to pay Paul. I think one of the biggest issues that lower income people have is transportation to get to the job. And if they get a flat tire, the car breaks down, they can't get there. Um, and therefore they don't have money to pay rent because they don't have a paycheck. So just a hiccup like that is, um, it really hurts. And so more transportation um, is, I think, a really good solution um, to the issue. Thanks. And I see Sandra and Bianca both agreeing that this is a really big challenge in, in your communities as well. And I think one more point I didn't make earlier was that the evictions, they're financially crippling, but they're also sending people into homelessness. Um, and so in the HEMIS, which is the Homeless um, Management Information System, um, we were able to put a couple of questions in there saying, you know, if they show at the um, shelter, whether or not they're there because they were evicted or they have been evicted in the past and can't find housing. So um, we are getting, you know, information around that. And it's really important that um, we understand where all our housing instability is coming from.
I think we can agree that since COVID, I don't think it, our economy has really recovered and people have really recovered since COVID. I think we can definitely dissect a lot of different things and talk about all the intersectionalities of housing and transportation. But since COVID, I've definitely noticed an increase in homeless population. Um, oddly enough, increase in transportation um, in Salt Lake City. Um, and with, with all these new developments and buildings, lack of parking and spaces to park your car, right? You have a lot of these events sometimes downtown and the, you know some families are like either one flat tire away from not being able to pay rent or a ticket, right? Especially with the, the parking downtown is it's not the best. Um, but I think we all can agree that after COVID things definitely did take a turn. Um, I know some for some of those who live in Salt Lake City, I've noticed an increase in homeless population. Um, I've noticed an increase in gentrification. And those are obviously things surrounding homelessness and transportation that we can address. But I think just with that acknowledgement, we can further the conversation. Bianca, I see you raised your hand. Oh. Yeah, I, I think those are really great points. I, I would also add um, how, uh, like you said, a lot of the new developments are focused on 80% AMI um, and a lot of new develop housing development um, has been for that demographic. And I think it does leave out a lot of the low income people that were mentioned in the presentation. Um, the communities that I work with are Kearns and Magna um, and the renter the renter population in those um, areas um, are the ones who get um, the most affected um, when there is not that many, there isn't that many renters rights um, and are more prone to getting displaced um, when uh, rents go up um, or property values go up. So I think there's a lot of things that um, I don't really know how to address all of that, but it definitely is a conversation that I'm, I'm glad we're having. And in my job uh, with the Early Head Start program, we give points to families. So if they are McKinney Vento or on SNAP, they automatically get 300 points. And then we also ask, is there any in, <clears throat> in food insecurity, transportation, diapers, those types of things that, uh, you know, will add up and put them higher on the list. But we have lots of families that are, you know, under McKinney Vento. Tonight, it is all about the start of this year. Mike is. Uh, another point worth mentioning is the fact that oftentimes low income housing or, or more affordable housing tends to be pushed out further to the edges of communities. Um, often making it more difficult for people to have access to transit, for example, if they have access at all. Uh, so making a flat tire, for example, devastating, uh, as opposed to possibly even having access to it in the first place. And so the lack of uh, inventory uh, of all housing types can make it extremely difficult on communities, uh, as well as giving people even options as far as transportation is concerned. Yeah, definitely. This is a great conversation. I am going to move it along. We have two more uh, big agenda items that we want to hit, um, but this was really great. Tara, thank you for sharing all of this. If you wouldn't mind sharing your presentation with me so I can include it in the follow-up email um, so everyone can reference back to that, that would be really great. Um, okay, so now we're going to uh, sh change gears and we'll go, I'll share uh, Alex's presentation and we'll uh, he's going to talk about UTA's long-range transit plan. Can you? Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, many of you have heard something about this. We've. Uh, uh, talked to the CAC before and done a number of different outreach events. Um, but uh, here to update on our long range transit plan. Um, 
we also have Megan Waters here from our community engagement team. And so she could answer some of the questions if need be. And also, of course, uh, Olivia Vons from our team as well. Um, so once again, just as a refresher, um, what we were looking to do is uh, think about all the needs uh, across uh, our the Wasatch Front in our entire service area. Um, we've worked over time very closely with uh, uh, WFRC and MAG, and they have a lot of our big capital projects and things that are happening in the future, but we have a lot of things that are not capital projects, uh, so we wanted to be able to represent those as well. So things like local bus service, our on-demand service, and uh, lots of other things um, that uh, we can show improvements to in this plan. Um, and we wanted to uh, think big about different ideas. Um, and we also have, in addition to uh, the items that are constrained in this plan, we also have additional vision items to look at things that we might be able to do should additional funding become available. Um, I'll also say we'll have time for questions at the end, but please, if something comes up while I'm talking, please feel free to jump in and ask a question at any point. Um, this is an overview of um, our plan timeline. Um, we started uh, back in, well, it was a while ago, uh, defining the plan. Uh, we hadn't had a long range plan before, so um, getting best practices from other agencies across the country. Um, we did some outreach uh, to communities across our service area um, and met with city officials and planners uh, about what they saw as the future vision, um, did a needs assessment, uh, developed some criteria. Um, once we had a sort of draft vision put together, uh, we had outreach and I believe we came here and talked about some of the things on on that uh, draft plan, collected a lot of feedback there. Uh, we did some fiscal constraint to see uh, based on uh, funding assumptions that have been developed in conjunction with WFRC and MAG and UDOT, uh, what we think we could uh, conceivably afford uh, over the next 30 years. And then in March 13, on March 13th, so only a couple of weeks ago, our Board of Trustees adopted our first uh, long range transit plan. Um, so version 1.0, I guess. Oops. And it's not going. Can you click the next slide, Lauren? Thanks. Uh, okay, so a little bit about how we developed the plan vision. Um, we have goals-based criteria, which I'll describe a little bit more. Um, we looked at what plans uh, and strategies already existed out there. So um, our partners, MAG and WFRC, had just, uh, we had just partnered with them on the updates to their plan. So everything that they have in there is also in our plan. Um, UDOT plans uh, we looked at and what we've already been looking at at UTA uh, and we also did some analyses to go along with that. And as I mentioned, we did some outreach, uh, fairly extensive amount of outreach to get feedback on that, put together a list of priorities. Um, and this just talks a little bit about um, the goals that we included in the plan and that they're tied to UTA strategic plan goals, um, including um, providing access to transit, uh, improved air quality, ridership, um, access to communities with high need. That's certainly relevant to our last conversation here. Um, serving new growing areas. Um, one thing that we tried, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. There's a lot on this slide. But one thing we um, have looked at through the course of this work is helping folks, uh, both our partners, elected officials and the public and really everyone just understand the whole variety of services that UTA offers, which runs everything from, you know, a regional rail front runner system to light rail, um, to different types of bus service that we have from just frequent bus to bus where we uh, maybe make improvements along the corridor to more like a UVX or OGX style BRT service. And then we also have our local bus service um, a new service that we're looking at, uh, which is a limited stop all day, and then 
our innovative mobility zones, which um, if folks are familiar with our on-demand service that operates on the west side of Salt Lake City, as well as uh, southwest uh, Salt Lake County, Davis County, and Tooele, um, that's uh, a sort of a catch-all for both that as well as other solutions that we might um, use to serve either lower density areas or areas um, where there might be lower transit demand right in the evenings or the, that sort of thing. So, um, so engagement, um, we had, as I mentioned, 57 listening sessions across the region, um, public meetings, as well as uh, an online public meeting. We got a lot, a lot of attention and input from social media posts. Um, we had two online engagement sessions and got over 5,000 responses on our online survey. Um, and we had over 30 different stakeholder presentations to groups such as this one, plus a variety of, of other groups. Anyone who wanted to hear about it, we'd essentially go talk to them. Um, and what did we hear, right? Um, frequency of service was a big, um, came up again and again, uh, enabling people to make more trips uh, without planning their day around when, when the bus or the train comes, uh, improvements and extension of front runner, um, new service and new areas. Uh, and we also collected over 1600 unique responses uh, indicating comments or support for or against specific projects that were on our survey map. Uh, we have four big strategies um, just as to highlight uh, maintaining our system, this is the less um, flashy part, but it's critical to making our service work, uh, making sure our fleet works, that everything's in good working condition, um, that we have workforce to support and facilities. Um, I talked a little bit about this already, expanding the frequent service network. Um, so we have more uh, transit that comes 15 minutes or better all day. Um, making enhancements to the system to make it easier to use and understand, and then serving new growing areas across the region. Um, we have this vision network, which is unconstrained. So um, not everything that's listed on here, um, we would necessarily be able to afford without additional funding available. Um, but this is just some highlights of some of the things that we can do with this, um, connecting more people, more jobs, uh, and better service. Uh, we also looked at what we think we can afford with um, our financial assumptions out to 2050. Um, and some highlights of that include um, new routes to serve high growth areas, uh, more frequent service, as I mentioned, um, more and better service on Sunday and all on weekends, um, as we were talking about with the previous discussion, right? Um, People need transit and transportation seven days a week. We found that um, that's a great need across our system, um, particularly people who work in uh, many service industry jobs or warehousing jobs. Um, they don't ask you if you can, you don't have the option to say you only wanna work during the week. So um, we need to have service available when people need it. Um, tracks improvements. Uh, and as I mentioned before, these new innovative mobility zones uh, in a number of places across the region. Um, just wanna highlight some, uh, as we were working on this plan, um, there were other planning efforts happening concurrently. Um, so we didn't necessarily spend a lot of time with things that had other studies going on. Um, that includes the Point of the Mountain Project, um, Front Runner Ford, that's looking at a lot of different exciting things about uh, 15 minute all day front runner service and other extensions. Um, the ski service, uh, which has gotten a lot of attention, had uh, studies going underway at the same time. So we didn't wanna put in something that was maybe gonna contradict other studies. Um, and then Jay, who I, I think just stepped out, um, has been working as one of the folks working from UDOT on a statewide uh, bus transit connection study. Um, there's also uh, community vision elements that are not in um, either one of the MPO plans or our specific plan, but
but we acknowledge that things are happening with them. One of them is certainly uh, the Rio Grande plan. Um, Salt Lake City has received uh, in partnership with UDOT and UTA, a, they have a raise grant and WFRC. Um, and they'll continue to look at a number of ways to improve east-west connectivity um, for people, for movement of people, transit. Um, there's gonna be additional look at the Rio Grande plan in that. Um, and then of course there's all manner of additional light rail and transit extensions um, that we recognize that we can't cover everything, certainly not in this first plan. Um, with that, um, we're done with, with this first version, but it keeps going, uh, similar to the regional transportation process that our friends at WFRC and MAG work on. Um, we're always looking towards the next version. Um, this has become a UTA program, this long range transit plan. Um, it's, we're folding it into the regional planning process. Uh, one thing we've realized working with our partners is that we need to look at a closer look at some of our financial assumptions for the future. Um, one thing uh, in our previous, in this version of the plan was we realized that we need to carve out some money for future uh, for maintaining our current system. And also that we need to, um, when we sort of do a deep dive on what it would take to increase frequency or add more bus routes, um, we don't, we hadn't previously had detailed financial analysis on that. And so we're looking to do a better job with that. Um, and then once again, the next update will uh, occur in sync with uh, WFRC and MAG updating their regional transportation plans in 2027. And with that, uh, happy to answer any questions or have discussion. Uh, we also have our webpage that's listed on here. It's rideuta.com slash LRTP. I think if you just Google UTA LRTP, it comes up fairly readily as well. Uh, we have a project map that you can move around and see by phase uh, and by mode, uh, what are all the planned projects, um, as well as the planned document and a whole bunch of other information. Um, happy to answer any questions. And we'll be sharing that presentation with our follow-up email. But yeah, any questions for Alex, for the UTA team? Maybe we covered everything in the last couple of meetings, but happy to answer other things. So on the um, like uh, community vision uh, elements, like part of the slide, you said possible future light rail extensions, and even on like the um, unconstrained version, there's no light rail expansion. So I'm just wondering why that's not like a main uh, looking area for you. Sure, I think that speaks to our timing. So. Uh, well, things like the pandemic, we were getting ready to launch this effort in early 2020. And at that point, there was not a lot of attitude or ap uh, appetite for thinking about what we're going to do with transit 30 years. It was trying to figure out, you know, what's going to happen during COVID, after COVID. Um, so we ended up a little bit behind WFRC and MAG in the planning process. We had been at the table with them as they adapted their plan. So we didn't really think it was good to include elements that weren't in those plans at this time. But one thing that we've discussed, um, the, all the partners, I think, um, that in our next planning cycle, there's a desire to see um, more focus on potential visionary items. Um, so I think we may see that over the next few years uh, and some other items that say, here's what we might be able to do should additional funding be, come available. And Andrew, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. We talked about it a little bit with the, in the unified plan policy meeting is this idea of, of um, what are the things we might be able to do that we know aren't constrained uh, by funding at this point? Well, um, thanks Alex first <clears throat> for going over all of that. And just, I wanna come back to your your question. So um, there are some tracks modifications that are in the plan, aren't there? We do. There is the, yes, there is the uh, an orange line to Research Park as well as um, 
the connection along 400 South and the Granary District. We don't have, I, I guess, further geographic extensions. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I meant. I was like, I, I knew about the Orange Line. It's just I was wondering, like, any more. Because, like, the Orange Line was, like, around two miles of, like, extension. So I was just wondering, like, if there was going to be any more than that. I think that's something that we'll continue to look at in the future. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, once again, the idea of this plan was, is not that we're done planning for out to 2050. We're going to continue to look at this over with our partners over the next four years. And we may see potentially substantial differences depending on a number of factors in the next plan. And to that point, uh, do you, those of you that have been participating on this community advisory committee from the beginning may remember that when we started this up a few years ago, we, we said, well, we're sort of at the end of a planning cycle, which is like every four years. So there's sort of less opportunity to change the plan that we're about to adopt. Well, now we're near the beginning still of the planning cycle. And so one of the opportunities for this group, one of the values that this group can really provide over the course of the next year or so is to help identify what are the things that would most benefit your communities, the you know, people that you work with, the people that you represent wherever in the, in the region. And then an out to Alex, and this is not just for transit, but it's for you know, state and local road projects, it's for trail projects, um, so people can bike and walk and take transit and drive safely and affordably. So there's an opportunity and we need to, we as the transportation agencies, part of our job in this work that we're doing here together is to make sure that you have the info you need so that you feel like I know how to, um, I know how to offer suggestions and I know how to get information out to the people that I work with. Um, and so that's one of the tasks that we face, our charges is to get you info so that you can give feedback to us earlier in the process. Um, Alex, to your point, uh, paying for things is always an issue. And so that's something we have to work on together. Um, but we shouldn't be limited in our imagination by what we think can be afforded now. Let's, you know, think, dream big. Um, and that doesn't just mean building a new rail line to somewhere else. It can mean enhancing service in the communities that have some transit service or some trails, but need, need more. So that, that's the course of action, course path th that we are on over the next year or so, right? What, just last thing, Lauren. Um, <clears throat> You know, so those of you on the, again, on the committee, you come to these meetings and it feels like, I, I imagine you kind of sometimes feel like every time you come to one of these meetings, we're talking about some different plan. And I could imagine you'd be like, what the heck is up with all of these plans? I can't keep them straight. Um, so first of all, sorry. Um, <laughs> but then second, like in a way, it just reflects that there's so much work going into all of this. And I think that we as transportation agencies have to figure out a way to make sure that you as community representatives don't feel like you have to be experts on all of the plans. What's more important is that you can say, here's what I think my community needs. And if you're thinking transit or roadway or whatever, like you can look at any of these things and provide feedback. Um, so we got to, we have to try, I'm just sort of looking at all this work through the lens that you might have as a community member that doesn't do this work every day. And I could imagine you feeling like, I don't know where to start because every time we meet with you guys, you talk to us about a different plan. So I guess I don't really have a solution to that other than I just want to acknowledge that it must be a little bit much. Um, and I think that's something that's a charge for us to work on together as transportation agencies to help you. And you can give us feedback on how we can do a better job as well. Yeah, hey, I, I have a question. This might be a little nitty gritty, but um, one of the biggest points of feedback in those surveys was increasing frequency. Um, how do you guys plan to accommodate that with drivers, workforce? Do you guys have incentives for these uh, for these individuals to 
um, continue to work so that you can meet the frequency demand? Yes, and Megan, if you have additional insight, please feel free to add. But um, that is something that we have been looking at quite extensively. Um, when I say we, I mean the big UTA, our uh, talent acquisition group and um, HR and everybody. Um, you know, we've done a lot of things to um, make the job more attractive. It's a you know a very competitive labor market right now. Um, there's a whole effort going on. I will say that being a bus operator is a very stressful job, right? Like um, driving in congested areas is stressful if you're driving a 40 foot long bus and pulling in and out of traffic is, is a lot. So um, there's also the way that um, historically there was a lot of split work. So when we were sort of more um, reliant on a lot of service and the morning rush hour and then the evening rush hour. Um, some folks would have a couple hours of work and then they have like a four hour break or four or five hour break and then another piece of work. So um, folks have been working to try to make those shifts more what we call straight shifts, like where you work a full shift all at once, provide more options, um, pay and incentives, enabling people to get in, into and start work faster. Um, they're just looking at the entire sort of gamut of things that can can make it a better opportunity for folks. Um, so we're definitely cognizant of that. I think we're starting to turn the corner a little bit on um, wrapping around uh, making sure that we have enough operators uh, as well as maintenance folks and people to maintain the vehicles. Um, it's certainly a valid point where you recognize it and are looking to move forward and planning for the future. Um, so in a sense for a while we were in catch up mode and now we're starting to catch up, but we we're starting to be able to plan out to say, okay, if we wanna increase frequency on these lines, we need to start hiring now. So we have the operators ready. Another thing that we're doing is we had at one point done most of our major service improvements in the fall um, and one thing that we found is we then would, after that, we would, uh, we would staff up to, um, provide the seasonal ski service, which ends in the spring. So then we have all these operators and we don't, didn't have work for them. So what we're doing now is looking to move our major service improvements to be in the spring. So when all these folks that we've hired to bring on for ski service, when that's done, we can, they can then shift to filling new positions, operating buses, operating more frequent service. So we're looking at a lot of different things to address that. Sorry, I have a follow-up. Okay, sure. so um, I wanna know who's like the target audience that you're reaching out to for these jobs. Is it that 30% that we mentioned? Are you providing them with competitive packages so that that 30% can also be entered into the job market and kind of have that wraparound approach of addressing the housing and security, job and security um, with the 30% population? Well, yeah, I'm not an expert on all of the hiring practices and Megan, feel free to add if you. I, I don't know if I'm gonna answer your question super adequately, Toya, but um, I would say we are dipping into that. We do have a competitive package, but I think something we're looking at is the actual wage. There's great benefits um, and that is hard when you are trying to afford rent, right? Like when you have the pension, but you don't have, when you don't have the wages to bring home. And so that is something they're looking at um, in terms of compensation and total rewards package. Um, we do have, um, and this doesn't fully, this doesn't fully align, but there are some unique creative strategies being tried out for tapping into different communities that may not have, um, considered, um, or been, been eligible, frankly, for, a uh, operator position at ETA. So one example of that is the ESL program that we're piloting and, and getting off the ground. Um, so that is, that's one example, I think, but there is definitely room for more, um, intent, intentional outreach 
our talent acquisition team does attend a lot of job fairs in the community and our community engagement department is um, going to a lot of resource fairs, um, community outreach events in communities across the service area, across the Wasatch Front. And we'll bring um, hiring information with us as well to those. So um, kind of kind of along those lines of getting um, getting getting in front of people that maybe wouldn't um, have seen a posting on Indeed or something like that. So. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna move on. We just have uh, about 20 minutes left and I wanna make sure that we get to the legislative session wrap up, uh, but we'll share that presentation and information. So if you have any questions that you think of, we'll get you in contact with Alex and the UTA team. Um, so I will hand it over to Miranda to give us a presentation on the legislative session wrap up. Okay, thanks Lauren. Um, let me just get this queued up. So I first want to say I'm glad to be here. I haven't had the chance to come before the community advisory committee yet, um, but I uh, I'm glad to see a few new faces and a few faces that I'm already familiar with. But um, just for for everyone, my name is Miranda Jones Cox. I do government affairs work here at WFRC, and uh, Lauren asked me to give a little bit of a. Uh, overview of some outcomes from the most recent state legislative session. Um, as part of my job here at WFRC, or a large part of my job at WFRC, is spending time up on Capitol Hill working with our legislators and um, and helping them um, as, actually get to this now, uh, part of our role at of uh, WFRC up on the Hill is acting as a technical expert. So being able to provide useful information to legislators to help them as they make funding decisions and policy decisions. Uh, we also work up on the Hill to convene our partners, our other transportation partners at UTA, UDOT, um, Mountain Land Association of Governments and others to um, come to consensus on some uh, maybe challenging uh, things that we are, that legislators are addressing during the session. And then lastly, we're up there advocating for funding or appropriations and policies that help advance uh, the Wasatch Choice Vision and Utah's Unified Transportation Plan. So we'll get into this a little bit more, what, what some of that means. But, um, but ultimately, it's a really great opportunity for WFRC to uh, have a voice up on the Hill and to um, represent our local communities that uh, that are part of the WFRC area. So a quick rundown on the session. Uh, some of you are likely aware the uh, session is kind of a, a condensed, very brief 45 days where there's a lot of uh, legislation being passed and appropriations uh, all jammed into those 45 days and it's kind of a, an intense uh, seven weeks. Uh, this year the legislature passed nearly 600 bills. This is the most bills that they've passed. Some of them see that as a, uh, a something to tout, something to be proud of and uh, others like the governor say like, ah, that's not a good thing. We, we shouldn't be passing so many bills. Um, but whatever your thoughts are on that, um, quite a few bills this year. Uh, and then the legislature also appropriated a $29.4 billion state budget. So this is all funding uh, that the legislature is appropriating for, not just for transportation, but for education, for um, uh, workforce services for really, really all government functions. So uh, just a high level uh, there. Uh, a few key themes <clears throat> coming out of this session that I think are helpful just to give a little bit of context is that, uh, of course, there's some things that are important to us, and that's, I guess, the angle we're taking this. Um, one is that it was a successful year for transportation investment. Um, we have seen over the past four years or so that the legislature has prioritized uh, multimodal transportation investments. So funding, not just for roads, but also for transit, for active transportation and um, moving year after year, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing that kind of change. We're seeing them not just prioritize roads and, and that's a really positive step forward and we 
kind of hope and assume that that same sentiment will will be be the case moving forward. I said I put here building on previous investment. This year there was mainly investment into roadway and transit, but last year the legislature did put um, about forty five million dollars ongoing for active transportation projects um, um, into a, into a new state funding pot and. Uh, just again, more and more years of, of great investment to, tr uh, multimodal transportation. Uh, I will say the, probably the biggest focus the legislature had this year, uh, was on housing. Um, Tara gave a great, uh, presentation on some of the housing challenges that the state is facing. And those are very, um, the legislature is very aware of those challenges and is, looking at some innovative ways to address those housing challenges because it is a complicated uh, issue. But that is where a lot of um, their uh, focus was this year. Uh, to that point, this idea of partnership, not preemption, our friends at the Utah League of Cities and Towns um, has been, have been using this as a way to represent what happened during the session. Um, in the past several years, there's been a lot of, you know, talk or discussion about potentially taking away local authority um, from local governments to make land use or zoning decisions for their communities to address housing challenges. And um, the outcome of this session was not that. The legislature really took the approach of working with local communities, with cities, municipalities to give them tools to address the housing challenges that they're faced with. And so uh, communities were able to maintain that authority that they, that they have. And then lastly, uh, it was kind of a, one of the first years in the past few years that there's been more of a limited budget for the legislature to appropriate. Uh, coming off of the COVID years, there was a lot of stimulus in the economy, um, which provided provided a lot of surplus funding for the legislature to uh, appropriate. And this was the first year where there really wasn't uh, quite as much funding available for the legislature to spend. Um, and, and that kind of, yeah, made it challenging for uh, certain entities or, or for certain um, groups to ultimately get funding for the things that they're hoping to get funded. So those are just a few key themes that I wanted to note. I want to touch, uh, again, as Andrew said, we're, uh, of course, focused on transportation here. I just want to touch briefly on uh, the most notable transportation appropriations this session. We won't go into too many details here, but notably, the legislature put um, over $1.2 billion for transportation infrastructure. Again, it wasn't an exception that the legislature uh, you know, continue to put money towards transportation. It's one of those important policy areas that they continue to fund year after year. So uh, you'll see bot, uh, top left corner, uh, 775 million one time and 330 million ongoing for transportation funding. This is to the transit, transporta sorry, transportation investment fund for roadway funding. Uh, you'll also see over on the right, uh, $45 million ongoing to the TTIF or the Transit Transportation Investment Fund um, for commuter rail improvement. So that is to the front runner commuter rail system. They additionally uh, funded a $50 million transit stop for uh, the front runner at Point of the Mountain. You all might be familiar of the Point of the Mountain development that is proposed um, in the south end of Salt Lake County. And then lastly, there was about $75 million in miscellaneous uh, uh, transportation projects that the legislature said, we want this specific project funded here. Otherwise, the, the rest of that funding, the you know, top two boxes, really are for UDOT, Transportation Commission, Transportation Partners to ultimately decide how that funding will be used. So some notable uh, investment there. Uh, there we, we track a lot of legislation during the session. I think there was maybe 60 bills or so that you know we were keeping an eye on um, during the session. And uh, we, of course, don't have time to go into too many of those. But I just listed, I think it's five here of bills that might be of interest to you um, that really deals with the work that we do here at WFRC. Um, and you, know, you can 
look further into these bills if you're interested. I'll actually throw up into the chat a uh, legislative summary wrap up um, for everyone to where you can further dig into the bills, find the links to the bills, summaries to these bills. Uh, but a few that I wanted to note, you'll look halfway down the page, uh, House Bill 430, Local Transportation Services Amendments. Uh, this is a bill that would allow for local communities to apply for grants, a state grant program uh, that would fund uh, innovative transit projects. So uh, shuttles, bus service, um, which would be intended to serve specific areas in communities that might be underserved with uh, transit currently. And um, this, we're really excited about this particular idea and hope that, you know, communities who might be wanting more transit, who, uh, who their uh, residents uh, are asking for more transit, that they might be able to utilize this program. But one that we thought was a really interesting and an innovative idea. You'll see HB 449, Pedestrian Safety and Facilities Act. Um, this furthers the, um, the definition of pedestrian facilities in the way that uh, pedestrian facilities are planned in, in roadway planning and adds bicycle facilities. So looks at uh, active transportation with a more broad lens looking at um, bicyclists. You'll see House uh, HCR 11, that stands for House Concurrent Resolution 11, concurrent resolution recognizing the importance of cross-issue growth impacts. Uh, this bill really encourages public sector, private sector, community partners, uh, to ultimately look at all areas of growth uh, when making funding and policy decisions. So looking at, um, you know, transportation and housing and water utilization and air quality as they make uh, decisions because we, we don't look at uh, growth through a, 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 with a, a narrow lens. And so it's important that as we all you know, move forward that we're taking into account all areas of growth. And then these two uh, up at the top, SB 268 and SB 208, these ones are a little bit more uh, complicated maybe to, to explain, but I'll just note that the, these tools are, um, were created to provide uh, housing, um, the, specifically for SB 208, uh, transit-oriented development. So to provide uh, affordable housing around transit stations and would use tax increment financing as a tool to uh, provide funding for those um, for those developments. And uh, the top one, SB 268, First Home Investment Zone Act is new this year in that it also provides uh, tax increment financing for medium density town centers. Um, so it, we don't have it pulled up here, but on the Wasatch Choice Vision Map that you'll see up there in the wall, there in the room, some of those colored polygons are showing uh, proposed center development where communities can really create or have indicated that they want to create, um, you know, mixed use um, areas of, you know, walkability, residential, retail areas. Um, and this tool would really allow for that to come to come to fruition. And so those two tools have um, home ownership uh, goals or requirements, um, affordability requirements, and again, kind of ties together transportation with housing to accomplish some of the state's housing and transportation goals. So kind of to summarize, what do these bills accomplish? The bills that I mentioned, and these were WFRC priority bills that, that we discussed transit-oriented development, centered development, providing housing choices, um, providing multimodal transportation choices, and providing better growth planning. So really, when we look at the legislation that we're um, helping legislators with up on the Hill or legislation that we're advocating for, it really is under the banner of the Wasatch Choice Vision um, and those, you know, four principles that we, um, that we stick to and housing, transportation choices, um, center development, et cetera. 
So I'll, I'll be brief there. I'm happy to answer any questions. There's really so much that you could go into about the session and some of those outcomes. And we really have only skimmed the surface even on transportation. Um, but there are some resources there. We, tra we have a bill tracker that goes through and outlines the, the bills that we were interested in, their summaries, links to the bill, et cetera, our appropriations tracker, um, and then a legislative session summary, which I'll throw all of these in the chat as well if you're interested in taking a further look and just getting more information, so. Thanks, Miranda. Any questions? None. Anyone online? Megan? I feel like weird for asking, but can you talk more about the innovation grant? Do you have ideas about who might administer that, what that would look like for communities? Yeah, thanks. So good question. Um, there, the bill, there's more information than I obviously shared on the slide, but the grant program will be administered by the Utah Department of Transportation. Um, they kind of willingly or unwillingly uh, decided to do that because they would kind of act as like an independent entity to, um, you know, select the grant recipients to put together the program criteria, and they'll do that in coordination with WFRC, UDOT, MAG, UTA, um, to, to kind of help develop how the, how the program will come together. Um, I, you know, I, I, we haven't heard of any like specific projects that communities have been like, we're going to apply for this in our community, but a lot of the specific um, desire behind this bill came from the Southwest Salt Lake County area. Um, where communities um, are seeing a lot of growth challenges out there in areas like Harriman or um, South Jordan or Bluffdale, Riverton. Um, and, and those mayors have been, you know, really interested in something like this. Um, same down in Northwest uh, Utah County in areas like Saratoga Springs and, and places like that. So I don't know if that answered your question. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Miranda. All right, we have about five minutes left. So we're gonna go ahead and move it to open announcements. So we have open discussion announcements. So just any general questions or announcements, upcoming events, things you want other folks to be aware of. I'm not sure if we covered this in past meetings, but in reference to the long-term vision of the front runner improvements. So with the, uh, I guess more of the weekend schedule where you have to wait longer, um, temperature control, wait areas, have, has that ever been considered in those places where you have that long wait for whether it's a bus because the weekend schedules, uh, but people are in the cold and, you know, I mean, back to what we were talking about, those who are low income don't have the resources to buy the very warm clothing. And I've seen it for myself and I'm just shivering out there. But, you know, in some areas, some cities, you do have enclosed and temperature control, you know, places to wait. Well, uh, a couple of things. We are, um, one, looking at, as I mentioned, ways to improve the frequencies on the weekends and later at night and that sort of thing. So to reduce that waiting time, right? Because ideally, you spend less time standing outside and the uh, transit vehicle comes sooner. Um, we are uh, looking at amenities, whether that's um, adding additional shelters or that sort of things. Um, we will be, I believe, planning to come next meeting to talk about, we have a, um, an effort underway that um, Olivia is leading that um, has an engagement component where we're looking to collect information on what sort of things people are looking for transit service 
And that can include not only improved service, more service, but also what are the amenities we'd like to see. And then we're gonna look at ways that we can um, sort of prioritize that in our, our, our budgeting as we move forward. So Olivia, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on that. Uh, yeah, so for that, um, we're yeah currently working on a route restoration equity index study that I'm leading. Um, and coming up, we're going to have a lot of engagement with that. And that'll be a big thing of seeing what are these areas, what are these gaps and barriers that people are facing that we maybe haven't had the all the resources or time to fully dive into. So things like the shelters and where those maybe specific areas that people, that there's a lot of people waiting that we want to make sure those are more enclosed areas. So yeah, coming up, we'll have more engagement opportunities to definitely dive into that. Okay, with our last couple of minutes, I'm just gonna go rapid fire. We'll go online. Uh, Sandra, any questions, comments? Not from me, not right now, but thank you okay. for sharing the link. Okay, wonderful. Carolyn, any questions, comments? Not for me, thank you. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> Bianca? I don't have anything else, thank you. Okay, Tara? Nope, I'm good, thanks. Okay, thanks. Tichelle? I'm also good, thank you for all the information today. Okay, thanks. Halima? Um, nope, nothing from me, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sarah? No, nope, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go in person. Uh, Toya? Jeremy? Yep. And we'll go Curtis? Mike? Nope. Uh, Brighton, I think? And then Steven? Okay. And then any of the partners? Anything? Andrew? Okay. <laughs> All right, then we'll adjourn. Thanks, everyone. Actually, I have something quickly. Wonderful. Okay, so um, World Refugee Day is coming up. So save the date. It's going to be Friday and Saturday, June 21st and 22nd at Big Cottonwood Regional Park. And it's just a time for refugees to show like their culture. So there's going to be a few dances and like cultural outfit fashion show. There's going to be many different vendors and such. So it's just a way for the community to engage with the refugee communities and um, just really get to know about them, like their culture, their food, their language, all that kind of stuff. So that is Friday and Saturday, um, June 21st and 22nd, and I can send over the flyer. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, send over that flyer and we'll be sure to share that in the follow-up email. And I, I have been to that many times. It is awesome. So let's definitely share that out with the other members of the committee. It's like really such a great day and event. It's really great. Wonderful. All right. Thanks, everyone.